Good. What time is it? It's good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Mark Salmon from Orlando, the Colorectal Clinic of Orlando, and I want to start by thanking Vince and the organizing committee for this distinct privilege of the podium. Um, when I look out, um, let's see here. There it goes. Uh, my disclosures are a speaker for Intuitive Surgical and now defunct uh, CSATS Incorporation. Um, when I look out into the audience, you know, I see a lot of extremely talented, extremely gifted, and extremely experienced surgeons. And, you know, when you think about the number of lives that each and every one of us in this room have touched, those lives that we have saved, it's actually humbling when you actually reflect on this. Every single one of us are experts in our field. And when we look at the grand scheme of things, we honestly did not get to the point that we're at by accident. It took hard work, it took dedication, it took years and years and years of practice. And when I began doing robotic surgery, I feel like I was no exception. I felt like I was a very accomplished laparoscopic surgeon. I was a program director for the Minimally Evasive Fellowship, so there was a lot I felt like I had going for me. And I went and began doing robotic surgery purely for selfish reasons. I'm being very open about this. It was purely selfish because of issues of self-preservation for back pain, neck pain, knee pain. And I remember very vividly starting doing robotic surgery and saying it absolutely sucked. I said it was the worst thing ever because what I was doing was I took an operation that I was a master at laparoscopically and now took this very big, very complex, very difficult instrument and began doing that very same operation. So not only did I complicate the operation I was an expert at, but I humbled myself at the same time in front of my OR staff, in front of my fellows, and definitely to myself. And when I look out into this audience, I see a lot of people that are even more experienced than I am. And what I want to do is share that experience with what I went through and share the experience of the roughly 40 fellows that I have the distinct pleasure to train since beginning uh, in uh, practice. Now, this opening slide is what I, I, love, I love to look at it because it tells a story uh, from a book by Kathy Sierra about uh, creating passionate users. And this is my summary. When the first time you do something, it's awful. The first time you do something, you definitely want to quit. The next hardest operation that you do is the second one. And the next, next hardest is the third one, then the fourth one, then the fifth one. And what she talks about in this book is that the more you do, the better you get. The better you get, the better everyone gets. The better you get, the, you go from a beginning level that everything really sucks to now you become an amateur. It doesn't suck as much, but it kind of still sucks. And as you continue to improve and improve and improve, you will reach a level of mastery that that's where almost things improve to the point where this is where a lot of things are great. I'm trying to advance the next slide. So when I look at the reflection of how to actually progress through this, I always start with the why. Why do I want to become a robotic surgeon? Why do I want to be this guy or girl that is doing robotic surgery? What I always say is start with your why. Now what I mean by that is do you want to do robotic surgery to prolong your career? Do you want to do robotic surgery to have improved visualization? Is it for teaching purposes, for marketing purposes, for surgeon autonomy purposes, for better patient care? Finding out what your why is certainly helps you negotiate this sometimes very steep learning curve. And that steep learning curve can sometimes want to derail you during the very difficult and challenging operations. So starting with your why and figuring out what that beacon is at the end of the tunnel, what that light is at the end of the tunnel, will certainly help negotiate those difficulties that you encounter. Uh, next slide, please. The other thing to look at is what is your baseline? Are you starting as an open surgeon? As you negotiate your learning curve, are you starting as a hand assist surgeon? Are you a laparoscopic surgeon? Or were your previously trained robotic surgeon now stalled? So would all these things come with their own value adds? So for example, one of my partners is training in open surgery. I'm sorry, he's an open surgeon now training for robotics. He has a distinct advantage over me as a laparoscopic surgeon going into robotics because he naturally 
uses his wrists, naturally uses his elbows, naturally clutches and naturally does things that a straight sick laparoscopic surgeon doesn't quite do. So as a laparoscopic surgeon, I used all my robotic instruments basically as laparoscopic instruments, straight sticks. Whereas a naturally gifted role, uh, open surgeon will translate those wristed instrumentation over to a robotic uh, platform very quickly. Hand assist surgeons live and die by tactile feedback. So by knowing where you're starting, what your baseline is, you know basically what gaps you need to fill and what things you need to watch out for. So a hand assist surgeon will immediately comment that when I go to robotic surgery, I lose tactile feedback. Well, you speak to any prolific and very busy high volume robotic surgeon and will tell you that the more robotic surgery you do, the more on-screen visual tactile feedback you develop. So that certainly develops over time. Next slide, please. The other thing is, well, probably one of the most important things is communicating goals to the operating room, a clear communication to the team that you're working with. So the tip, the biggest tip that I can say is when starting out, set a very specific and measurable goal and realistic goal for said operation. So for example, if it's a low anterior resection that you're doing, I will very openly say to the room, my objective in this operation is to take the IMA laparoscopically. I'm going to begin the, the, the splenic flexion mobilization laparoscopically. Then I'm only going to dock for the pelvic dissection for this operation. Or I'm an open surgeon. I'm transitioning to robotics. I'm going to go for one hour only robotically, and then I'm going to open. So those clear expectations communicated to the room certainly help with taking the pressure off of me as a surgeon to overperform and doesn't allow me the... The, uh, it, it essentially helps remove some of the prideful nature that I might have in the operating room. Next slide. And the other thing is truly an honest self-assessment post case. So this is one of the most important messages that I'd like to deliver today is an honest, obsessive video of, you, of your personal performance in that operation. If you think about any athlete, all athletes review their own tapes from, for games, pre-game, intra-game, post-game, and, and during practice. I mean, what makes us different when this is the highest state game ever is surgery? Why don't we review our own videos? And so this is something that I will um, preach about incessantly, about obsessive video review and also liberal collaboration amongst your colleagues with social media and courses, etc. Next slide, please. And also case selection. This is, um, in the interest of time, I'll say that uh, case selection is critical. I think starting out, if you're a super high volume general surgeon, then you can be a little bit more selective with the, which cases that you offer relative to a lower volume, say purely colorectal surgeon that only has a couple cases that can be done in a, in a month. I would say post all of those cases if you're lower volume in order to get more touches on the robotic console. Next slide, please. And tip for decreasing costs, I'll close with this. Same instrument use every time, using multifunctional tools such as, I got this from Dr. Lugaris, using a vessel sealer as your mobilization plus ligation of vascular pedicle plus, using it as a needle driver during a case if you're only throwing one stitch. So there's multiple ways in which you can cut cost and, um, and trim off a little bit of the excess uh, fees that, that you may initially um, uh, encounter during this. But I'll say that, and next slide please, that one of the nicest things that I've ever heard was, when it comes to robotic surgery or anything in life, first get good, then get fast, and then get cheap. <laughs> I hope that this has filled some of this and given some tips and tricks for the robotic startup. Thank you for the privilege of this podium.